Good morning, folks. I'm very happy to be with you here at San Diego. Um, so my name is Alexis Clifton. Um, I'm the executive director for SUNY OER Services. You'll hear more from me later in the afternoon, but um, I, I'm super excited because of all the other people that you'll be hearing from today, um, primarily our keynote of, of the day, Robin DeRosa from Plymouth State College in New Hampshire, Plymouth State University. We are at university. Yes, now. I know very that. Very particular about that. Coming out of my mouth. Oh, believe me, when the students change names. Oh, yeah. Yes. It's a big deal. There's a big hazing process that goes into it. Right. So, so um, really, really quickly, um, in my former life, before this job, I taught um, English composition for many years in uh, Washington State at different schools there. And um, I started here, while I was teaching there, I started hearing these rumblings about this really cool um, literature textbook that was kind of in the works and that was open for anybody to use. And then it's just been really fascinating. The further I get into this open adventure, the more and more contact I have with the origin of that project, Robin. And so, you know, now, you know, if you're a Twitter person, actual ham, follow her. She's awesome. Um, that's how I learn about all the cool things that are happening nationwide. So, um, but really quickly, before I hand the floor over to her, um, I haven't done it yet, but I will. Well, actually, I think I did just do it. Um, I didn't bring print copies of the agenda. I don't know why, but I didn't. Um, but I do have a Google Drive folder set up for the day. Most of the materials in there will be for this afternoon, but it does include the agenda for the day. This is probably going to be fairly flexible. We'll bend and flex depending on what people are interested in pursuing, what rabbit holes you want to jump down. Um, but we've got a rough sketch of what we're going to do for the day. Um, so the morning um, is primarily going to be Robin and then questions for Robin. So um, be, just keep her on her toes. <laughs> She's good at that. And then um, we'll end the morning part with um, a faculty panel from both colleagues here at SUNY Oswego, as well as a few visiting from elsewhere in the state. Um, my OER road crew, crew that <laughs> travels with me regularly. Um, so far, I'm one of you, so it's a few, you're my only good early bird, thank you. Um, and then the afternoon, be a little bit more hands-on, there'll be some opportunity to get your hands dirty and try to put some materials together that might be appropriate. Whether you're an administrator or a faculty member, you'll, hopefully there'll be something that you can take away as a concrete goal for the day. I do have a few infographic cards in the back. Um, I've actually got a lot more with me, so if they're not enough. Just take some for your friends, go home, put them on your fridge, you know, slide them under your neighbor's door, needs to know about the same, <laughs> whatever makes sense. So uh, don't worry about taking them all off that one. All right, Rob? Great. And by the way, thank you, Don King, for helping organize this day. Everybody here at San Jose is really happy to be here. Hey, everybody. Um, so, John, I'm like a big pacer. Is that okay? Just keep it on the slides. Um, I'll definitely be irritating by the end here. Um, so, I think as Alexis mentioned, the day is really flexible, and I think we should take advantage of that since we're a small group. And even though there is a Q&A period after the break, so like I'll mostly focus on the, um, on the slides and then we'll have plenty of time for your questions. But I really don't think there's a problem if something's not clear or you wanna talk about something as we go, but just shout it out. It's really not a formal environment. So I think we'll be better off if we just take the time we need and kind of not worry about the agenda so much and um, focus on what your needs are. But the most helpful thing would be because after this we have a little break and then we're really focusing on questions for like a good chunk of time is that you really need to have some and so <laughs> when we're doing the slides i think two things will happen one is that you'll be excited about something but you won't really know what i mean or what that would look like so maybe just make a note and then we can come back and really dig into the thing that interests you. And the other thing is that you might have skepticism about something like, well, that sounds great, but no way, or not for my discipline, or that wouldn't work, or I don't understand. So make notes of those things as well so that we can come back to them and, and see if there are uh, responses that might, might help answer some of your questions. Um, so please, please, 
remember those questions, write them down, be ready, and then we'll, we'll have a much better session after the break. Uh, I believe that's your lighthouse, is that right? Oswego? No. Oh. <laughs> no, that was just taken last week. That was taken last week. Um, I don't know. I that, that's what Wikipedia told me that it was Oswego, but I don't know. Yeah, that's yeah, actually it looks like it is. Yeah. It's part of our yeah. one. Yeah. 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 You guys, our Q and A session is totally going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how excited you get about one little thing. I, could do. Uh, I see the port. I see the port. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't want to claim that I know what this slide represents, but there you go. I. I think it might be you. Um, but this is really where I want to start, uh, which is framing some of the conversation that we're going to have about open education with some of the larger context for what's going on in higher ed, but particularly in public higher ed right now. And this is a book that transformed a lot of my sort of convictions as a faculty member. Um, so maybe I'll start actually by telling you that my PhD is in English, and for about 20 years or so, I taught at Plymouth State, which is really uh, comparable to Oswego, um, in the English department, teaching early American literature, which is about 14 to 18, 1400 to 1865. Um, and I started uh, transferring over to interdisciplinary studies, which is our customized major program, and that's what I direct now since um, 2014. But when I read this book by Sarah Goldrick Rabb a, a couple of years ago, um, I really realized that a lot of things that I had originally not thought were my responsibility as a faculty member with an interest in early America, I thought I really knew kind of what my, my responsibilities were for my students that were very disciplinary focused. Reading this book transformed my commitment to thinking more broadly about access in, in higher ed. Because some of these statistics just absolutely blew my mind. She was based in Wisconsin at the time, um, but her sample sizes are huge. So these are this is some really good data that she looked at, um, and including some national data. This will surprise nobody. Um, some of these things, uh, since many of you, if not all of you, are working in the SUNY system. A generation ago, public colleges and universities got an average of 75% of their budget from the state, and today it's about 50%. Um, in New Hampshire, we would be so stoked with 50% um, because we are 50th in the nation for the public funding of uh, higher education. Arizona and New Hampshire are like always in battle, so we're winning right now, we're last. Um, and so my university is about 9% funded by the state, which really gives me pause when I try to imagine how that is a public university, right? Like if your kid, went to third grade and you had to pay the cost of say like you know 80 no 91 percent of the tuition i don't think you'd be like my kid goes to public school right so it's a little weird how we think about public education and of course that is getting that problem is exacerbating um, over the years especially since the 2008 recession 23 percent of low-income sophomores worked a job between the hours of 10 p.m and 8 a.m. in her study. She talks really movingly about coming into class one day, um, and there was a student, uh, some of you have had this horrible, horrible experience when a student falls asleep in your class. Um, and it's especially horrible when you think you are giving like one of those just totally awesome classes, right, and everybody's engaged, and there's a student sleeping, and she was really offended, and she told the student, you know, come see me in my office immediately after class. And of course, she's kind of personally offended as well. And the student apologized, um, but had literally gone to school the day before, gone to work all night, come home and chugged coffee after coffee after coffee, and then gone to class without going to sleep. Um, and she realized that she was not understanding the conditions under which her students were trying to learn. Um, this is a data that has also been corroborated by some recent studies in the New York Times that were more national. But she found that one in five um, community college students were food insecure and 13% were, um, were homeless. And uh, that was actually data that I couldn't believe. You know, when I saw it, I just thought, I'm sure that's not correct data. But now, since her book came out and everybody got interested, those studies have been replicated even on larger scales, and they're disturbing. Um, but some of this stuff is actually pretty 
in some ways hopeful and interesting to me. Like 50 to 80% of the sticker price for college, like what families actually have to pay, in many cases comes from non-tuition costs. This, this, especially if you're at a state school or even a community college where those tuition costs can sometimes be lower. Those non-tuition costs, the, the things you have to pay for in order to go to school, so that includes um, board and your food and your transportation costs and of course your textbooks, right? Um, those might be things that we're also able to deal with, that we're also able to intervene in. Um, more than three in four students attend college within 50 miles of their home, and it's especially true for low-income and minority students. This matters to me as someone who teaches at a regional institution because we talk about, like we're worried about our schools, we're worried about enrollments, especially in the Northeast, we're having enrollment declines and we're working on that stuff. It's imperative that we keep our regional colleges healthy. It's not okay to absorb things into flagship institutions because students who live near here need to come to school here. And if they don't come to school here, many of those students are not gonna to come to school at all. So that's why I'm committed, particularly to helping our regional schools like, like Oswego um, intervene in some of these problems. The average net price for a year at community college is 40% of a low-income family's annual income. And at a public university, it could be from 16 to 25% of a middle-class family's annual income. We're talking about huge costs and burdens. Um, if any of you are parents, then this is not surprising you in particular, right? I have a 15-year-old right now, and I wish she would age backwards because I need a lot more time to figure out how I'm going to pay for this. 60% um, of Americans ages 25 to 64 don't have a college credential, but 22% of them earned credits trying to get one. Uh, we call that um, credit but no credential, right? So they, they wanted to go to college. They had the idea that that was what they wanted to do and they weren't able to complete college. Probably in your enrollments, you're looking at those adult learners, right? You're saying, how do we get those students back to school? Because we know those are students who wanted to go, right? That's, we don't need to look into international markets necessarily to find our enrollments. They're right here, they wanted to come, but they're prevented and precluded from finishing college. So when I work on open education, this is the landscape that I'm looking at, and these are some of the problems that I'm trying to solve. I'm not really interested in one of the things we're gonna talk about, which is cheap or free textbooks. That's just a piece of how we look at this broader um, la landscape, especially for public higher ed. But when we talk about textbooks, it gets pretty gross, and I find that to be motivating, right? So this is actually uh, an image from The Economist, and it shows the consumer price index, and then it shows how the cost of textbook prices has, have been rising. Um, the Economist, actually, this is not DeRosa, this is The Economist calling this a textbook case of price gouging. And if you map um, healthcare on that chart, it will be in between the consumer price index and textbook prices, right? So the, the cost of textbooks has, have been raised, has been going up faster than the cost of healthcare, which is the main thing we're usually like, oh my god, healthcare costs, right? Um, so this is significant stuff. I also see people like uh, taking photos and whatever. That's great, do it. Uh, these uh, slides are all, of course, openly licensed and they're available on uh, my slide share. You can find that by going to my website or um, on Twitter, just about right this second, on my account, it tweeted out, it said, hello, SUNY people, um, here are my slides. And you can just click on that and get all of these slides. And because they're openly licensed, you can go back to your department and be like, I made some slides, right? <laughs> You're going to be like, I got graphs, I got charts, right? You can, you can take them into the cabinet if you are a provost, and you can say, look at these slides, right? Um, this is a really good one for faculty, in my opinion. This is from the Florida Virtual Textbook Study um, in 2016. They also did it in, in 2012 and then replicated it, so it's pretty good data. It's like uh, 22,000 students in this um, survey. As a faculty member, I don't really want to say that I didn't care how much books cost, but it would be the kind of thing where I would look at two books, and this book was 180, and this book was 120, and I would pick the one that was 120 because I was a good person, right? And then I felt like I did my duty. What else can I do? When I saw this data, that was when I was like, oh my god, that is not enough. This is a problem. Because what this data shows us is that high textbook costs 
are actually completely a social justice issue. They are keeping our students from succeeding and completing college. Let's take a look because it's amazing. This is students reporting that 48% of them took fewer courses because of the cost of the learning materials, because of the cost of the textbooks. When a student takes fewer courses or fewer credits, we know that it extends their time to graduation. And when you extend their time to graduation, we know the data shows us what happens much less likely to actually graduate, right? So that is a serious problem. Uh, they, choose, they don't register for specific courses. We see this all the time. If students find out that one section of math has OER and the other section does not have OER, everybody registers for the OER section, right? But in general, they are picking and choosing their courses based not on what they want to take or even maybe what they need to take, but on the cost of those materials. Um, students are dropping and withdrawing from courses simply because they can't afford the learning materials. They're earning poor grades and failing because they can't afford the textbooks. And no surprise to any of us, 67% of them report that they don't buy a textbook because they can't afford it. If you teach, you have never had the experience of having a required book and not having at least a couple of students say, I need another week or two because my check hasn't cleared yet, or I'm sharing this book, or I, I couldn't get it, or I'm trying to find a copy on reserve, or whatever, right? That quote unquote small minority of students that doesn't have the textbook, um, those are the students that we're looking at here who are more likely not to do well in your course or to withdraw. Um, especially because some of those students are our most vulnerable learners. And what happens is after a week or two without the book, you've just said, we're going to disenfranchise you for a couple of weeks in a course that was already going to be a challenge. How's that going for you later with your grade, right? So to not have books at all or to not have them at the beginning is having a huge impact on learning. When I saw this data and I started to really understand it, I realized this is really nothing to do with something like how much does a book cost? This has everything to do with whether my students are going to make it through college. And then I really started to care. Um, we know students are paying a lot of money for books. How much money are they paying? The data is weird. It's like people will fight about this. Because if you look at new book costs, like the cost of what they're asked to pay, that can be as much as $1,500 for a semester. Um, we also know that our students are not buying new books, right? They're either buying old versions, used books, they're renting their books. I mean, renting a book is just the saddest thing, right? Think of the symbolics of that. Like, here's the book, and then you're like, give back your learning materials, right? It's just heartbreaking that we would build an educational system that takes learning materials away from students, right? Um, but depending on how much the tuition is at your college, these can be hefty percentages. Actually, at some community colleges, the cost of books can be like 55% of the total cost of, of college, right? Um, so depending on how good, you know, my state tuitions are high, yours are a little bit lower, so it depends, but it's significant. This is actually from a study. This is so interesting to me. Students worry more about paying for books than they worry about paying for college. And the reason is that they have a plan for paying for college. And a lot of times it's a really bad one, right? But it's some kind of plan that they thought about before they got there, right? They've got student loans, they've got some parental support, something. But the books, you know, they go into the bookstore and they are just blindsided, right? They have no idea what to do. So they either, you know, if they can't afford the books, they either don't buy them or they'll put them on credit cards. And um, if they have a credit card, right, then not many students um, not all students have credit cards. So there's real challenges there for them about what they're going to do when they're confronted with these costs that they did not expect, and it causes significant anxiety. What that means is that if we solve the textbook problem, we're really going to contribute to student success in college, and we're really going to alleviate a lot of anxiety. Um, and success in college is not just good for students, it's good for institutions. Why? Retention and graduation rates. Is that something anyone ever talks about at SUNY? <laughs> like every five seconds, they buy fancy software, they try new high-tech garbage to get the, here we can do this, right? This is retention, this is completion, there's direct evidence that it, it, that it um, helps in both of those cases. Also, when students are electing to take fewer credits, it means they're paying for fewer credits, right? 
So in many ways, this is a healthy cycle. There's a win-win all the way around. I want to talk particularly, though, in this session, so I have a different PowerPoint for the cabinet, right, where we talk more about the wins for institutions. But in this presentation, I want to really talk about the wins for faculty, right, for learning, because lowering costs is not enough. Because I'm sure you are asked to lower costs all the time here at SUNY in ways that are not good for learning, right? Um, there's all sorts of cuts and austerity and measures that we have to take because of budgets that are generally not super good for students, right? When we hire more contingent labor and more adjuncts, we're not saying, this is great, costs are coming down, right? So the idea here is not just cost savings, it's cost savings that are good for students. And so that's an important distinction to make um, in my book when everybody is in a sort of cutting frenzy, that this is not really just about lowering cost. Um, because the amazing thing about OER is that we can solve a problem in higher education right this second and it will be good for students. And there's almost nothing else that I can think of in higher education that we can say that about. So here's how we do it, and this will be old news to some of you and new news to others, right? For the ones who are, are new to it, it's kind of like, are you kidding me? Um, open educational resources uh, are openly licensed, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, free textbooks, so textbooks um, that are no cost. Now, I say no cost, uh, meaning a couple of things. They're free for students to use if you use them online. If you want to print them out, you got to pay for the cost of printing. So a book that normally, say an anatomy and physiology book that might be $325, um, in the OER version would cost, call it 25 bucks or something. Um, when I say printed, I don't mean like on your printer at home. I mean like you order it, it's a printed book, it comes in the bookstore, and the students don't know that there's anything different about this book than any other textbook. These are OER textbooks from um, OpenStax out of Rice University, um, but there are multiple places where you can get good, peer-reviewed, um, open textbooks. Now, for all of you who are writing that down, OpenStax, OpenStax, this is just the beginning, my friends, and your librarians are going to help you do this, and I'm going to help you do it this afternoon. Um, so I don't want in your notes to be like, get open size textbook, right? That's just one of so many awesome places. But my God, if you teach, if you teach, my friends, intro to biology, and you are asking your students to buy a $200 or $150 textbook when there is a perfectly good free version. When I say perfectly good, I don't mean Robin looked at it with her early American literature <laughs> PhD and said it's perfectly good. I mean, the data shows that faculty and students consistently rate these books as the same or better quality than commercial textbooks. It's kind of a really pathetic mantra in OER. Same or better, same or better, right? Because that's what the data keeps showing, yeah. I just wanted to share something that most people probably don't know. Mm -hmm. The college physics book that is pictured in your slide, uh, one of the lead authors is actually an emeritus faculty from here. That is fact. <laughs> and it is verified uh, by the physics table. Um, <laughs> math and physics, they hang out together. Um, yeah, it, these, these books are great. And actually, um, one of the key early, um, not early, um, American history textbooks was done by a colleague from, uh, he was one of the key editors, a colleague from my system. Um, so same thing, whenever I see that book, I'm like, I need to tell you that this place, because there's, there's a point of pride here not just because somebody wrote a great textbook and you know the person, but because these are um, faculty members solving a problem for students, you know, using uh, the time and the resources that we have to contribute to massive change for students. Um, and when I say time and resources, I want to point out that this, these books are free for students. They're not free to make, right? It's called academic labor. And, let me tell you, the Academy is not doing an awesome job on academic labor right now, right? Um, in general, we are exploiting academic labor all across every sector of higher ed, which is why it's really amazing that SUNY and CUNY have $8 million to say we recognize that this is academic labor. We want to compensate faculty who are working in these, these ways, and we have provosts I won't name any names, but we have amazing provosts who are committed 
to this kind of thing, then understand that finding the time and the space um, and helping to access these resources are important, right? Because it's not gonna be free for you to even convert to an open textbook, right? It takes a little bit of time to look at a new textbook and review it and check it out. But I wanna tell you that you can adopt an open textbook for the next cycle of your course. Whatever you teach at the lower levels, there probably already is a really good open textbook ready for you to go. Now, if you teach a seminar in queer Latin American um, literature, first of all, literature is a little different, right? Like, we, we, don't, we wanna read some canonical contemporary Latin American authors, they need to be paid for their books, right? So there's certain things, we're talking about textbooks here, and not just books, right? Like, you may need, if you teach political science, you may wanna read, um, you know, some attorney general's account of something or other, and that's a book, and you buy it. We're talking about books that are made as textbooks to help students learn, and those are the OERs that exist. The more specialized you get, the less likely it's there, but the fields are moving really fast, so we're developing all sorts of things quickly. Uh, the other question we'll talk about maybe later is ancillary materials. It's a big deal for lots of you in your fields. So if you teach social psychology, about a year ago, there was an awesome social psychology textbook, but it didn't have test banks and question banks and all the weirdo things that I don't understand that psychologists want in their textbooks. Um, so a colleague of mine, Rajiv Jagiani, spent a year with his students developing test banks and questions and all that stuff. Then they gave them to a pod of graduate students who spent another semester vetting them and revising them, and now the test banks exist for that book. So we're catching up with all of the stuff that we need to have full services associated with these textbooks. So awesome, solved, done. Seems like we should take a break and come back. But no, and now I feel like I'm like, no, there's more. You get some knives too. So let's, <laughs> let's talk about the stuff that really excites me about these open textbooks. So what makes a textbook open? Not that it's free because there's free junk all over the internet, and we don't call that stuff open or OER. Anyone associated like with a library, they're all like, that's right, sister, right? Because <laughs> the librarians totally get what I'm talking about. Um, so let's talk about, there are two ways that open materials are free. And we talk about that as free as in gratis and free as in libra. So gratis means free cost, right? No money. Sometimes in OER we call that free as in free beer, which I don't totally understand because there's no beer that's free usually, so that's weird. But it's, no, you don't have to pay any money. But free as in Libra, it, like liberation, that's a different kind of free, and that comes from this open license. So all of these open textbooks are openly licensed, generally using Creative Commons licenses. And what that means is that uh, they sit on top of copyright. So if you write an open textbook, it's copyrighted to you, just like anything that you would write or publish. So it does not mean that you give up your copyright. But what, what happens is like if I write something, I write a textbook and it's copyrighted to me, and you want to use it, what has to happen? You all have to ask me for permission. You have to ask me for permission, right? And a lot of times you have to pay me for the privilege, right? Or talk to my publisher and my publicist if I had one. Um, so what these Creative Commons licenses do is they say, you don't need to call me and you don't need to pay me. I'm going to tell you exactly how you can go ahead and use this without any extra need. I'm giving you permission. So there's lots of licenses, and you can pick the one that's right for you. The most open is that top one, the attribution license, CC BY. And what that means is Creative Commons by Robin DeRosa. And if I have something licensed under a CC BY license, it just means take it, use it, do whatever you want with it, please tell people that the original was by me, and link back to it. So if people want to see my cool version, they can, they can get to it. Um, so there's always attribution. You always get credit for the hard work that you've put in. But it allows people, for example, you know, if you write a physics textbook, or not just a textbook, Perhaps just um, one quiz or worksheet that you're willing to share, a lab of some sort, and you're willing to openly license that. 
We can say that it's CC by, somebody else can take it, but they can say, oh, I don't actually have you know, this equipment, but I have this equipment, so I'm gonna change it just a little bit. So you're able to revise and shift as much as you want. Um, that's helpful when you have a textbook. So for example, there, if there are a couple of different OER biology books, you might take all of this one, but you really don't like chapters three and four, take them right out. And maybe you really like chapter seven over here, pull it in. So it allows you to revise and remix. Some people love that. Some people are like, dude, that's way too much work. Fine, just adopt, right? But the open license gives you that kind of freedom. Uh, there's also different licenses I won't talk too much about. Non-commercial is uh, basically, you can take all my stuff, you can use it, you can revise it, have fun. Don't make any money off it. I don't want you to make money off my stuff. My students choose that license all the time. They're very, they're like, I'm gonna share this thing, I'm gonna make a website, and put it, but I don't want anyone making money off my work. And then I'm always thinking like, do a lot of people want to make money off your work? Because how do I get a piece of that? How does that happen? Um, so you have to think about the license that makes sense for you. Um, I won't talk about it too much, but sometimes photographers, for example, like the ND license, non-derivative. You can take my photo. You can use it in your textbook. You can put it on your blog. I don't want you to crop it or stretch it or make it look weird. I want it just the way I want it, um, and that's an ND license. So there's different licenses available um, uh, to put on these textbooks. And if you're going to use a textbook, you want to kind of understand um, what the license is. And I keep saying textbook, but that's not really the right term, right? Because we do have those classic textbooks, but there's lots of other stuff that's OER as well. Um, this OER, because of the open licenses, have what we sometimes call those five R's. Um, the ability for students um, and faculty to do the following things. Retain that work, right? Unlike an ebook or a rental that expires and they have to give back, um, they can retain this stuff forever as long as they want. They can reuse it, remix it, revise it, um, and share it as much as they want. So those are the five R's of OER that make it not just free as in no cost, but also free as in freedom, right? So it's important to understand that. And when you're talking with your colleagues and they say, oh, I use OER, but they're just talking about free stuff on the internet. Free stuff on the internet's great. I use it all the time. I encourage you to use it too. But there's a difference. If it's not openly licensed, we don't call it open. Uh, this is SUNY. I know Lexus may have uh, better numbers and you may hear more about this. But look at, I mean, this is just, SUNY, right? Um, 6.1 million direct dollars in student savings. Um, can you imagine, for example, if you were able to say that at SUNY Oswego, in biology, if you take biology here, you will not pay any money in textbooks, right? It's one thing to do this uh, by yourself in a course. I have saved, personally, students tens of thousands of dollars and I only teach, it's a little different now, but mostly teach English, which is a very low cost field compared to some of your fields. So you can save tens of thousands of dollars on your own, but when you link up with colleagues, you can do crazy things that allow you to do this kind of bragging that really makes an impact with families. One community college president told me that the number one question he gets at open houses is, how, what's the cost of books here? How much am I gonna have to pay for books? So if you can get, for example, a whole department interested in switching, um, if you can get a couple of colleagues who teach, for example, a certain course across multiple sections, those are the things that are really, you will be shocked how fast that money grows. OER has only been going on for a few years, and one of the main advocacy groups in OPEN just hit the $1 billion mark in American savings for OPEN since we started, and that's direct savings to students that those savings pay off for institutions because of how we can uh, increase enrollments and uh, work on retention and completion. But here's the part where faculty, I think, should get really excited. Because it's not just this access to knowledge, right? Um, access to knowledge is important, right? This is about the throughput rates um, and helping our students succeed and complete. So let's start by looking quickly at these. So a throughput rate is generally calculated as an aggregate of drops, withdrawals, and see or better averages. 
So what this means, and it's a big number for administration, right? We want to look at student success kind of all clumped into one number, and we call that a throughput. So uh, in this particular study, they looked at a number of studies and found um, that in all that when they took the aggregate of all of them, students who use OER perform significantly better on the course throughput rate than their peers who use traditional textbooks in both face-to-face -face and online courses that use OER. We'll talk about why. One obvious reason is that students have textbooks and they have textbooks from day one. So that makes a big impact. Um, but there may be other benefits that are happening with OER that we'll look at as well. Here's some brand new data uh, out, of, out of Georgia, and um, that's the whole citation there. But this one really uh, perked me up when I just heard it. There's a one-third reduction in the drop, failure, and withdrawal rate among minority and Pell eligible, right? Those are poorer students in courses which switch to OER. So the benefits in student success were more pronounced for our vulnerable margins of students, right? So um, this is really working the way that we hoped it was going to work, right, when we started doing this. And the data is pretty persuasive. Um, and I said this before, right? Almost all, I think there's like one or two tiny samples uh, that shows like same or worse. Tons and tons of studies that show that perception surveys, like did you like this book? Does the book work? Do you feel like you learned? You know, all of those perception surveys from both faculty and students rate this OER as same or better quality. Does that mean there is only high quality OER? No. There is some hugely crappy OER. I have made some of it, I'm sure. Um, there's also really crappy uh, commercial uh, textbooks as well. In fact, um, my favorite uh, example of that is a book by James Lowen called Lies My Teacher Told Me, which is about the crap you can find in commercial American history textbooks, you know, just wrong, wrong, wrong stuff all over the place. So we still have to talk about peer review. We still have to talk about assessment of quality the same way we talk about it with commercial offerings, right? Just because you pay for something doesn't make it high quality, right? So the same issues exist. The data is showing us that OER is, um, is, is sort of winning that race right now. When I started thinking about access to knowledge, though, I started thinking about textbook costs as one piece of that, right? This is not, for me, a movement about textbook costs. It's a movement about access to knowledge. So I accompanied the movement towards OER with a more concerted plan for my whole program um, about how we could think about access to knowledge. And I would encourage you to talk to faculty about this as a movement to broaden access to knowledge and not as like, hey, you want to come on board with my new textbook initiative? Because I don't find that particularly inspiring, nor do I find it to be much of a long game. But when I started saying, OK, we're going to move to all OER in my program, uh, we also we have a, a large campus food pantry, which may, do you guys have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we have one as well. Um, but I opened what, I, and I, the reason I show this picture is to show you when I said I opened a food pantry in my office. As you can tell, that is a bookcase with like some spaghetti and granola bars and whatever, right? When I say I opened up a food pantry, it was not hard. It took me like a half a day to put this together. But the symbolics of that is that food insecurity is an academic issue because if you're hungry, you can't learn. Moving that stuff into the department and asking my faculty and staff to think about that every day as they walk by and to have students who are coming to meet with me about advising see that part of what I'm concerned about is are you fed um, was a transformation of how I thought about academia, right? So uh, that's why the food pantry is there. Um, we also started doing new things um, for students who were paying for college with our GI Bill. We started looking at the actual barriers that veterans were facing and choosing the customized <coughs> majors that I offer. We started ride, uh, ride boards and childcare co-ops. So <laughs> as you're probably aware, because of um, liability stuff. I could not open a daycare in my office, which I sort of tried to do, but you can't do that. So one thing you can do, though, is you can make it easy for students in your program to talk with other students. We use a little um, digital app that allows them to contact each other when they need rides or emergency child care, and we don't really get involved in it, but they work together as a kind of cohort. Now, we do aim at adult learners and, and parents in my program. 
but mostly students don't use this stuff very robustly, but it matters that the parents in my program, particularly single parents, understand that we get that your challenges with childcare are going to be part of the things you have to deal with in order to succeed in college. So putting that out there and making a commitment to solving the problem on a local level, not just whatever big things public transportation is doing in your region, but you personally, as a scholar of philosophy, right? Or you know, as a uh, sociologist, like whatever your thing is, inside your department, you're paying attention to these actual needs of students. So we did lots of other stuff. Um, this one's important, right? Uh, we switched to OER, we made everything free. Uh, we also generally used everything digitally. So what happens to the students who don't have devices? I called our uh, institutional research people and I said, you know, how many of our students have laptops? And she, uh, she said, you don't have to worry about this. You can have a laptop required class because 96% of our students come to Plymouth State with laptops. So what did I immediately think? Yeah, wow. But I'm going to immediately disenfranchise the most vulnerable 4% of my class, right? We did not at that time have a program where you could check a laptop out of our library. So before I switched to OER, I made sure we got that program. It doesn't really solve all the problems. If you've ever worked on a wiped laptop, it's kind of challenging. It doesn't have any of the things you need really to be successful. So we have to navigate a lot of things. Every time you solve one problem, another problem will pop up. But instead of being embarrassed or being like, I failed, or sort of, you just keep being explicit about the problems and trying to solve them. And so we're trying to do this holistically, not see OER as some band-aid that's going to fix everything. It's part of a larger set, set of commitments. Um, because we started moving towards a lot more technology, we've got some of the peers in the program to become these peer mentors who sit with us in our office. We became more of a drop-in center. People who do advising get this, right? It's a drop-in center. It's a student success center. You get it. Academic departments don't get it, right? We don't, we don't have like a, a drop-in mentality. So I changed our academic department to be like that. Do you need help? Come in. And the person who's sitting at that desk can help you with technology, can help you with your assignments, can help you with writing, can help you um, access resources, can help you with food, can help you with a whole set of things. Whoever is sitting there will assist you. Um, these are things you can do for pretty low cost and you can do internally in your spaces. So here's where I really start getting excited though about pedagogy because it's not just access to knowledge. Are you well fed? Do you have the book? Can you come to the table to learn? It's also access to knowledge creation, becoming what we call contributors rather than consumers. Um, so that's the part that really started firing me up. I started by thinking about the cost of books and switching to OER and making sure students had access to knowledge. And then I got excited about what started happening when I was working with these materials in classes, realizing that if I wanted to, there was a lot of potential there for new things that I could do. And that's what I'm going to tell you, um, this little story, which some of you, like, was anybody at CIT here besides the people who are running this today? Yeah. Mostly just the people who are, are running it. Um, this is a story I tell a lot, and I wish I had a, a different story to shake it up a little bit, but it's really such a, such a helpful example that I keep telling it. Um, so this is up in the left here, the Heath Anthology of American Literature, which was my textbook. For textbooks, it was pretty cheap. It was like 90 bucks. That is not an expensive textbook, actually. Um, but I went and I heard this guy talking about Creative Commons, Cable Green, hello if you're watching. <laughs> he's not watching this right now, but uh, he's the education director of uh, Creative Commons. And he came and he talked about Creative Commons and open licensing, and I just had this epiphany, which was horrifying, because the Heath Anthology Volume A, which I used, is all literature from 1400 to 1800, which is all what? It's all public domain literature, right? So my students were paying $90 for access to public domain literature about their American heritage, right? The joke I always tell is that is the most American thing that you could ever <laughs> imagine. And so I was like, we can, I think we can fix this, right? So I, I put together a little um, Google spreadsheet, went on Facebook to our department page, and I asked, does anybody want to work on this over the summer with me? We're going to get some public domain versions and build a new replacement. 
And a whole bunch of students, about 10 students ultimately signed on to the program. Uh, a few of them had just finished the course, so they were kind of excited. They, they wanted to, to do this work. And then a few were about to take the course, and they were like, hell yeah, I'll get rid of the $90 fee. $90, no joke for my students, right? An absolutely real chunk of money. So they were happy to do it. Um, I went to the provost to ask if I could have a little bit of money because I wanted to mark the fact that these students were not in a class with me. And that even though they were students, this was academic labor, right? To go out and build this textbook, and I wanted them to be paid. Um, the provost said, I don't even know what the nutty thing you're talking about, no way. <laughs> uh, because OER was not really a, a thing at the time. It was not something that uh, people had heard of the way they did now. So I went to my department chair. And they said, can I get some department money to build this thing? No, no, you can't, uh, partially because we didn't have that much department money. So I funded the student labor out of my own pocket, which meant I did not donate to my university that year. I donated to my students. But I tell you this not uh, to make myself a martyr, but to explain that the total cost in terms of paying them for what we produced was about $400. That's how much I seeded this textbook. You can find $400 for OER now. Um, and it doesn't have to be expensive to build things in different ways if you bring people together into the project, right? So none of us did an overwhelming amount of work to put this together. Um, and so we all came together and we built the first version ready to go for the fall of the open anthology of earlier American literature. Um, and the students were so stoked. They're like, we went to the bookstore. There's no book. What do you mean? There's no book. I'm like, that's right. There's no book. And I was like, you're a hero. Um, and then they started using it, and they despised it. It was horrible. Um, and the reason was that it didn't have a lot of things that they needed. Um, early American literature, you know, uh, one of the things we start with, um, well, we have a lot of the native oral texts at the beginning. Uh, I, I, as a teacher, was pretty disturbed by their relationship to the native oral texts because most of those texts are, um, they come from 19th century white ethnographers, and it's really important to understand that that's what you're reading when you read that stuff, but how are they going to know that? There's no notes, right? There's no introduction. There's no scholarly glossing. Then we get to, like, Cabeza de Vaca a Spaniard who's down in Florida, right? And they're all like, well, the pilgrims discovered America. What's, why is the Spanish guy? And I'm like, oh my God. Um, so they really were thrashing around without that scaffolding stuff. And we, for a brief moment, thought maybe we were sunk. And then, of course, we figured out what I'm sure you've all figured out already, which is that the students could build these pieces of the textbook that were missing. So, for example, Hannah, um, who actually, this is so great because there's a slide that I built a, a while back and now Hannah is actually um, the advisor for my program. She graduated and I hired her. And it's just random that that's her piece right there. So it's really nice. Hi, Hannah. Um, so uh, Hannah, for example, uh, read ahead on Christopher Columbus by two weeks, did a little research project, introduced Columbus, wrote a little paper, got some public domain images, got some maps, put that all together, we dropped it in the textbook, the next week the rest of the class caught up, and there's all this wonderful stuff about Columbus. It's especially wonderful because Hannah, who's in the class, wrote it. So number one, Hannah is stoked, because the stuff that she used to write and, and put in Blackboard, and no one would read, and it would be like soul deadening, like, let me tell you about Columbus, my teacher is forcing me to put this in this stupid place that no one will look, right? Instead, she was putting it in a textbook. Everyone was reading it, so she was thrilled. The other students were thrilled because they used to read introductions that were written by scholarly people like myself who don't really speak the language that they need when they're like, you know, tell me about the Haitian Revolution in clear language, right? These guys were doing that, right? They were speaking to them the way they wanted to be sp spoken to. So they actually ended up liking it better than the Heath Anthology as we went through. And then, of course, we realized we could do all sorts of things. Like Jonathan, he likes to make videos. So he can make a two-minute little video about Toussaint L'Overture. And we can drop that in right before the section. And people can watch that two-minute video and get a little bit of a gloss. W what do you do? You know, do you make infographics? Do you want to draw a map? Do you want to make a cartoon? Like, we can do all sorts of things 
into this textbook that will make it lively and vibrant. I layered in a little app in the sidebar called Hypothesis, which is a nonprofit company that runs a, an annotation um, application. And so students could annotate on the sidebar and talk to each other about the text. So sometimes they would say, like, what the heck does that word mean? And they would answer questions. They put in funny gifts and videos sometimes. Um, we had a, a critical theory book, and the hypothesis guys were kind of watching us because we were early adopters of this technology. And when I was teaching Freud, my student notes were so funny I, about Freud that every morning the hypothesis guys would come and be like, we were laughing so hard. Because I use hypothesis as a public annotation for the most part, so my students are annotating, and really anybody can see those if they want to, which is actually great because um, the next cohort of students can come in, and they can interact also with each other's annotations. So you build a kind of community network um, around a conversation about the text if you want to use it that way. Um, and then I started, I moved to another department, and it was kind of a tragedy in some ways. I was like, I just built this totally awesome project, now I have to leave, right? It, it could be really good. And it really wasn't that good the first time. Um, but then my colleague, Abby Good, who, who took my line in the English department, she forked the anthology, took, took the version, copied it over, and started fresh and made a new uh, revision with her students that focuses a little more around environment and sustainability, which is what she works on. And uh, her version's way better. And then people from all over the United States started forking that anthology and making things and doing better stuff, especially a guy named Tim Robbins, who really got into it and was doing great stuff. Um, his stuff was, was great, people were inspired by the project, and so it got picked up by uh, Rebus Community, which is a nonprofit um, OER ecosystem for publishing, and Rebus has grant money from Hewlett. They got about 20 academics together who took our original, somewhat mediocre version of the Open Anthology, and they're building it out, and that should be released um, maybe this year, uh, maybe in a few more months after the new year. When that one comes out, you can see here, this is my original table of contents, um, and this is theirs so far as they're building it. Some of my student work is still in there um, that will uh, go through peer review and, and be in the final version. When this one comes out, it's going to replace permanently, no question in my mind, the Heath Anthology of American Literature, the Bedford St. Martin, the Norton Anthology of American Literature. It's going to change academic publishing. This was a small group of undergraduates, right, who really put this project together. Um, this is what we mean by that students as contributor model. And a lot of times people say, like, oh, so great, you do, like, public domain literature. I don't do that. Like, it's not helpful to me. I don't do public domain literature anymore. I teach interdisciplinary studies, mostly um, business majors, allied health, physical therapy, um, you know, pretty much all sorts of things that you can imagine from social sciences, humanities, fine arts. Um, science, uh, STEM, everything. So here are some other little examples of mine. Um, we made one for a first year seminar. Uh, 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 our students um, created a, a course textbook that looked at student retention and completion from the undergraduate level, from the student perspective. And these first year students who sometimes struggle even with basic writing and <coughs> research skills put together a pretty impressive collection, a, a survey of the data on student success filtered through the stu student perspective, and it's a, it's a really great book. Um, interdisciplinary Studies is the program I teach uh, now. It's a customized major program. We've converted to this course textbook. We're in the middle of a three-year build. <coughs> so we used the commercial textbook for the first year, learned the foundational principles. The students kind of recast those in new ways that they thought were student friendly. We built a skeleton. Um, now each year we're taking the gaps that exist and we're building those out. At the end of every semester, we curate the best work from the semester and uh, as a class, choose things and put that in so that you know, it takes a while to replace the commercial textbook. Um, but when we finish this build, it will replace the sort of two or three commercial offerings in, for uh, intro to interdisciplinary studies. Um, People have already done this for most of the fields that you teach. Um, there are open textbooks, but you can take an open textbooks for, say, uh, physics or anatomy and physiology or business management, and you can ask your students to write problem sets, um, to add infographics, to put, uh, if you teach a history course, take the open stacks, 
history, but then have students write current events. For example, you know, if you're studying early American history and some of the Native American stuff, have somebody write an essay on the Dakota Pipeline and pop that in, right, so that you've got kind of current event things. There's all sorts of ways that students can get involved instead of dumping their things in the learning management system where things go to die. Um, you could instead put things into something that has life. So here's some examples of uh, what we sometimes call now open pedagogy, right? The pedagogy that accompanies working with these free and flexible materials. Um, sure, you can do student-generated textbooks. That's kind of the thing I love to do the most, but that's just one option. Um, students can edit and curate textbooks. They don't have to write the stuff themselves. They can make the ancillary materials. They can add multimedia pieces, videos, um, so, you know, songs, like whatever you can think of. They can add, of course, in the sciences, um, simulations and video for labs and all sorts of stuff can be uh, helpful. A lot of times we call this in the field non-disposable assignments, right? Instead of those assignments that students give you, you grade them. Especially in the old days, we'd leave them outside our office doors. They would not pick them up. Then we would throw them literally in the trash can, right? Instead of that disposable assignment model, where, what can you ask your students to do that truly contributes to the field, to learning, to education? Um, we have students uh, editing Wikipedia really helpfully. That can be big things, like they do a whole semester research project and end up writing something large for Wikipedia. That's intimidating. We've had, for example, um, women's studies courses, and all they do is they find inappropriate uh, images. So for example, on the uh, Women in El Salvador Wikipedia page, there was a really um, poor choice of image, which was just like a woman in a bikini, kind of like a sexy, whatever. And then all the text was about like women in politics. and when, So the, um, the women's studies course would survey how gender was portrayed on different Wikipedia sites, and do things like swap out photos for, um, for better choices. Technical writing classes would look for Wikipedia entries that were kind of poorly written, and actually not change the content, but just clarify in the writing. Um, so there's all sorts of ways students can contribute uh, in that stuff. Um, they can write op-eds for you know, significant national publications, or for your local newspaper, right? Your local newspaper will oftentimes be thrilled to have content um, that's thoughtful and well-researched from your students. Um, that, you know, the local newspaper is not where things go to die, right? It's where things go to live. Uh, if you do cool assignments and your students make great projects, instead of uh, throwing them away, you can just make a little website for the class and post that assignment with their permission. And now over the years, you take the best two or three every year and you start growing this wonderful database of cool things that people have done uh, in a research project, say. Um, uh, of course they can blog, but I'm always skeptical. Like if somebody comes to you, like sometimes they'll come in to the instructional designers and be like, I need to start a blog with my class. And you're like, okay, why? I don't know, because everybody's blogging. We need to blog, right? Like, you don't have to blog. Um, but blogs are great, right? They're, they're just basically a way of publishing publicly the work. And usually when my students blog, I suggest to them, because they're all excited about looking very professional. But sometimes they look too professional, and they'll post something, and then people will actually comment and be like, what, what do you mean? Like, this, this is not a, the correct interpretation of this particular law, and it's like, you might want to say at the top, hey, you know, I'm a, a, a freshman and I'm just starting to study this, can you? Because then when people comment, they'll say, this is a really great beginning. You should read these people. This is a better uh, route for you to take, right? So there's great ways to use the web to involve mentors um, in, in programs uh, to help students. We call that connected learning when we hook students up with their professional and academic communities. And that's really, I think, why I've seen some pretty explosive growth in my own program. Uh, from 1974 to 2014, my program averaged 10 students total enrolled per year. I did it like on the side with a couple other faculty members. It was just a place for weird students to go with weird ideas, right? So 10 students a year consistently from 74 to 2014. In 2014, I switched to OER, I started working with open pedagogy, and I started doing connected learning, where my students were using the web to connect to their communities. Um, and we grew uh, 
about 1,450 percent. So we're now one of the largest majors since 2014 at Plymouth State. We've got, I think, about 130 majors at this point. Not one thing changed with the requirements for the program. So the only thing that changed was the pedagogy behind the program. Um, this is at a time when the enrollments in general are very difficult in New Hampshire. So it's not like students are you know, flocking in. I believe that it's because students are excited to be doing applied uh, high impact practice, which is something we talk about a lot. This is a great way to do that kind of teaching. So let me show you a couple other things. Um, my, and I know, I think I'm going over time, but I'm just not worried because we're so flexible <laughs> and I just like to keep going. And also, what are you going to say when I'm like, I'm just going to keep going, is that okay? <laughs> like, no, say no. But anyway, um, so I start my class, uh, we read a, a great article by Audrey Waters called The Web We Need to Give Students, which is about saying uh, that we need to offer students um, what we sometimes call in the field a domain of their own, a web space where they can, I hope that's not my phone, is it not? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> not to embarrass you, but it'd be more embarrassing if it was mine. Um, <laughs> so the idea here is that when students come in, instead of putting stuff in Blackboard, where at the end, of, and, and I'm all for Blackboard, like I use it um, in order to like post my syllabus and some links and some PDFs, but when student work goes in Blackboard, and you're ready to go on to the next class, the thing that you do is you take all the stuff that your students produced, you delete it, and you import that you know, empty shell for the next um, class, right? The, the stuff that comes forward is the old stuff. I mean, you don't lose that old stuff, but your new class has nothing to do with the old stuff that your students created. I didn't like that model of kind of digitally flushing away what we had accomplished as a team from the semester before. So instead, the domain of one's own ethic is the idea that students create their own sort of management system on the web so that their work lives with them. And when the course is over, it doesn't get flushed away. It stays with them. They own it. If they don't like it, they can certainly flush it away. Um, but but it's, it's somewhere that's more under their control. It's the difference, I like to say, between Alcatraz, which is like Blackboard, right? Where it's hard to get things in there, it's hard to get things out, there's shark infested waters. God help you if you want to collaborate with a faculty member, you're like, come into my Blackboard, you only need 11 passwords and we'll call IT and they can, they can put you in or whatever, you know. Instead, and I know, I know you have very kind instructional design staff here, so they're not <laughs> dying right now as I say. No, I'm dying laughing at you. Just good. <laughs> Sometimes you can see them like, we've been working so hard just to get the damn people in Blackboard, you know? Oh, I, know. Do. I know. I do. Yeah. But and, yeah. and you know what? There's a time and place, right? Because Blackboard is, is, is safe and private, and it's good for certain kinds of work, right? Absolutely. But it does quarantine your students. So when you read the lies that are in your mission statement, right, about how you connect students and how they're engaged, the architectures that we build are not architectures that live our mission, right? We want to do those things, but we don't. We might do them in small ways, like, oh, we have a service learning office. You can go see Michelle, and Michelle will help you do engaged things. You know? <laughs> I don't do engaged things. Go see Michelle. <laughs> um, instead, we can get all of our pedagogy working more in these ways. Um, so instead of building Alcatraz, let's build. Let's have each student build a home of their own. And instead of surrounding that home by shark-infested waters, let's surround it with pathways and roads that let people come in and visit and collaborate and listen and, and mentor. Um, so how do we build those architectures? So at Plymouth now, we're using a domain of one's own, which is an actual uh, project um, out. It started at the University of Mary Washington. And it's basically nothing fancier than students get a domain, www.whateveryouwantocallit.plymouth.edu, um, when they come into my program. And it's a space for them to work. Now, I spend a lot of time at the beginning of the semester talking about working on the open web and the pros and cons and challenges of that. We can talk more about it. Some of my students do not do it because it's part of developing agency and empowerment in students to respect them when they have reasons for not wanting to be public on the web. Usually, they don't have those reasons, and I try to 
tell them why they might not want to be public on the web, because there's a lot of good reasons. We can talk about that more. Um, but for the students who do choose to do it, they create their own uh, spaces, and they all look radically different, right? This is Jane. She's majoring in conservation ecology. Um, where they talk about their research and they talk about their projects and they basically do their work in, in, uh, in public, it moves from the kind of old e-portfolio model, which is like, you know, if you, I don't know, do you guys have a product? We have Mahara. I don't know. Sometimes there, there's kind of like, you know, products that schools will get for e-portfolios, but they're very drag and drop, right? Like, you must look like this template. Um, but instead of that here, the students are de designing uh, their own spaces and they're really becoming creators. Instead of mining data on our students the way we do with the LMS, like I know exactly how long you were there and like you don't know these things, but my students are horrified when I tell them like I can see how long you spent on that quiz or whatever. Um, but now the data is theirs, right? They can see who's spending time with them, right? And, they're, and they are in charge. Um, of sort of what is collected and, and how they're analyzing it. Uh, they can go from the audience of one or 20 or whatever's in their class to more of a public impact model. The work lives with them instead of the course. Instead of this broadcast web, which is basically like one thing gets put out and they consume it, now there's kind of a synergy where they're able to talk to people, their peers, their other professors, their families, their friends, and their scholarly and professional networks. We call them in my program e-courts to distinguish them from the portfolio where it's like, I put my two best projects and my headshot, you know. <laughs> Instead, it's like a port of call um, or a portal, right, that allows people to come in and interact with them and work with them. And they have full control uh, to delete and keep and curate as they want and as we go. Um, I might ask you to look at these later if you're interested, but these are some student reactions to working in these ways. Um, that's Madison's daughter. Uh, she had a baby in high school when she was 17. She writes about all this on her e-port, so I'm not giving anything away. But she talks about how the flexibility of the program and learning in new ways like really uh, sort of animated and empowered her. Um, my favorite quote there is, we do not post our homework to a hidden school-controlled website. But I love that she puts homework in quotes, like homework, like what the hell is that, right? Uh, because the idea here is we're, we're not doing the homework, there's no hoop jumping, right? We're doing real work, actual work, the kind of work that scholars and practitioners do, right? Um, and sometimes that's, you know, real introductory and basic, but it's, it's important. Um, and here's Becca. Uh, that you can read about how engaged she was. This is a really funny one about how she's so committed to mushrooms and her ability to work publicly on mushrooms has transformed her life and she has all these mushroom-related opportunities now. Uh, I didn't know there was a thing called a mushroomery until I met Becca and learned all the things about mushrooms that I never knew before. Um, and she's absolutely wonderful. But, she, but the work that she did online connected her up with communities that led to an internship and, and when she graduated um, to a really awesome job in mushrooms, no joke. Um, so actually this is a little video I wanna, uh, this, is old, this is an old one now, I have better ones now, but um, this is, uh, is it gonna actually play? I don't know. Hit play. Hit it again? Hit the play button. I'm trying, I am here. Oh, see it's, it, the cursor's different on here than it is there, let's see if I can. There we yeah. go. Um, I'm just scrolling through because, it, and it's actually kind of irritating to watch this play, so if it starts like giving you, just look away. Um, but this is uh, uh, Taylor, and this is her final capstone project, which was about connections between neuroscience, music, and education. Um, she was looking at the effects of music on the brain and how it changes learning. But you can see that the ability to use um, multimedia um, was really, uh, exciting for her, and the work turned out to be so robust and interesting that it was, it was amazing for her to be able to put that on the web. She won a big award from the Association for Interdisciplinary Studies for the best undergraduate research in the country with this paper. What was more exciting, though, is that when she won, I said to the organization, do you want to post it online? And they were like, what do you mean? Right? Because they, they'd always gotten papers from students before. 
So when they realized that her whole, all of her research was online, they put that on, her, on their website, and everybody was able to come and read her research. That's so much more valuable than just being like, she won this award, right? It would have been her picture and her name. Now, everyone all across the country was able to read her project and engage with her, write comments on that, on that piece. So it turned out to be really wonderful. Um, so, yeah, this basically just says we're, we're giving them a key, off they go. I want to kind of finish up. So I spent a lot of time in these three domains of my teaching for a long time, and I thought all was well. Um, the domains of knowledge, like I got to teach you some stuff. Here's the basics for the course. You need to learn it. Um, I wanted them to understand that. Don't just regurgitate it. I really want you to be able to say it back in your own words and feel comfortable with it. And maybe even apply it a little bit, right? If I take a slightly different example, you'll still be able to take that. And I spent 20 years teaching in those three domains, thinking those are the three that count. Everything was good. When I started working in open, these other domains opened up. First, that survival domain. They can't get to knowledge if they can't eat, if they don't have transportation. Um, we've had students um, dealing with uh, cancer in my program. I think my attitude before used to be like, that's horrible, I'm gonna be so compassionate, but like obviously you'll need to withdraw or whatever. What can I do now to allow students to continue learning while they're ill? Um, what are the ways that I can help them get to knowledge when life gives them barriers? Um, but also for the open pedagogy piece, how, once my students can apply that knowledge, how can they contribute back to future students, to the learning commons, um, to the next cohort that's gonna come through? And how is that gonna transform? We talk a lot about training students for labor markets right now. What jobs can they get? Will they be employable? We don't just wanna train them for labor markets. We want them to be transforming the labor markets that they're gonna graduate into. In what small ways can your students start affecting the world a little bit so that by the time they graduate, the world reflects a little bit more the people that they are? Um, the, the longer game plan for me in working on open is a resurgence of public higher education. So no secret here, I have, a, I have an agenda. Um, and the agenda is much bigger than open textbooks. Um, there is a college earnings premium. Uh, you know, uh, you'll, you'll make 114% more money if you graduate from college. And we hear this stuff all the time, right? Why should you go to college? Because you'll get a better job. And these things are true. But I think it's reductive to think that that's the only benefit of going to college, that college earnings premium. Look at what happens when you go to college. These private benefits, right? Your fringe benefits in your job are likely to be better if you go to college. Your rate of unemployment likelihood is lower. Your health is better. Your chances of becoming disabled are lower. Your chances of going to prison are lower. The satisfaction with your life is higher. You will have a better marriage. You'll have a 25% lower mortality rate. And your life expectancy will go from 74 to 81. And weirdly, these benefits will be partially passed to your children, right? Your children will be likelier to enjoy these things if you go to college. But there are also external benefits that happen, right? There's productivity spillovers in regional income, right? So if more people go to college in this area, that area will be more productive and more financially viable uh, in the region. A greater college earnings premium means greater tax revenues for that local public. Um, a reduced need for public assistance, lowered crime reduction, and a lower dollar value in caring for um, crime victims. Each potential college degree is conservatively worth 481000 once you subtract out the costs of sending those students to college. This is research by uh, Philip Trossel at um, the uh, University of Maine, not Southern Maine, University of Maine. Uh, he's an economist. And he's basically looking at the dollar values, right, associated uh, with, with college. The net government spending on higher education is actually negative when you look at the financial benefits that come from going to college. Uh, the rate of return on taxpayer investment in college students is 10.3%. I don't know what you're getting in your savings account right now, but that's crazy good, right? And the rate of return to state and local government specifically is 3.1%. 
What all of this is about for me is helping publics understand the value of public higher education. And it's incontrovertible, in my opinion, that we have high value. Like all the data suggests it. It should not be impossible to make this argument. It's not just about going out looking for corporate sponsors and private business partnerships to keep our public institutions going. We should be able to make a case to the public that our institutions are beneficial and that they matter. And using OER and working in ways that are more open to the public impact of our work, these are things that we can do to help the public understand that we are a system um, that functions and works for students. So here's the takeaway. Public higher education should be sustainably funded with public dollars, be supported by public infrastructures like OER, where the money doesn't go out to commercial endeavors and instead stays inside the system. We pay ourselves to give ourselves what we need. We should be committed to broad access Transcend institutional and academic borders. We work across SUNY, we work across CUNY. Um, we work in partnership, not competition with each other. We expect collaboration rather than competition between our institutions. Develop learners as citizen contributors to the knowledge commons. Develop faculty as agents of the public good in teaching, scholarship, and service. And expect administrators to speak the language of public and support public approaches to our work. That is the end of that. So I want people to understand it kind of as a broader movement rather than textbook pods. Um, we're over, so what I'm gonna do is let us take a break and then we can come back and do a few questions and um, see where we are. The afternoon session is more focused on tools, back-end stuff, where do I start, how do I do this? Um, so if you wanna take some small steps, we'll, we'll do more of that uh, later on as well. Right? Thank you.